Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Reich of Crime Talk, and thank you for watching. First on the docket, Lori Vallow seems to find a new husband when money woes begin. Second, another cold case solved by genetic DNA testing. Third, an unsolved cold case needs our help. And the dumb criminal contestant of the day. And a bonus feature, little old me got put into a fancy magazine. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Scott Rice from Crime Talk, and thank you for watching. First, if you haven't done so already, we would ask that you would please subscribe. If you have not hit that little bell, hit that little bell so that you receive notifications of when we put out new content. And as always, leave us a comment below. As always, please leave a comment about what we discussed today. We do care about what you have to say. First on the docket, Lori Vallow. Hmm, that's right. We all know Lori Vallow. She's currently in an Idaho County jail pending charges related to the disappearance or desertion of her two children, JJ and Tylee. Well, there's some information that's come out about Lori Vallow and her bankruptcy filing many, many years ago. Specifically in 2005, Lori Vallow filed for bankruptcy. Now, that in and of itself is not an issue. Frankly, lots of people file for bankruptcy. It's actually in the Constitution, if you can imagine that. It's, that's true. Lots of people have to do it, particularly after a divorce or during a um, sickness. It's, it's a reality of life. But what is interesting as it relates to Lori Vallow is, is that when she gets into money troubles, she always seems to find a new husband. Let's talk about this. So back in 2005, Lori Vallow was on husband number three, Joseph Ryan, and they were going through a divorce. Now, during that time, Ms. Vallow uh, was filing for bankruptcy. She apparently was living in a home, a very nice home in Austin, Texas. She was stating that she had $6,200 a month in costs that weren't covered by the $3,900 she was apparently making from the salon each week. Additionally, she was receiving $1,500 a month from Joseph Ryan, the ex-husband, as it related to child support payments. Now, with all these money woes, fortunately, they all disappeared when she met Charles Vallow. Now, they were married. There was a divorce that ultimately um, went about, but Charles Vallow was killed by Lori Vallow's brother. It was originally ruled as self-defense, and now uh, that's being investigated uh, as well. It really doesn't matter as all the parties are dead, unless, of course, there was some sort of a conspiracy uh, between Lori Vallow and perhaps her brother. Uh, we'll see if that can uh, pan out or if it could even be proven in a court of law. I doubt there's some smoking gun item out there, but that's what the police are uh, appear to be looking for. Now, just before um, Charles' death, uh, he was notified by the insurance company that Lori Vallow was trying to change the beneficiary on his life insurance policy. He was alerted of this and made sure that Lori Vallow was taken off the policy, and so when he passed away, she received nothing. Now, as we all know, She's now with Chad DeBell. As we all know, um, Chad DeBell had a very unfortunate uh, series of events as it relates to his wife, Tammy DeBell, uh, passed away. And uh, fortunately, Lori was there to comfort him and to get married just two weeks after um, Tammy's death. And fortunately, once again, the money woes disappeared uh, during that time because why? We know Chad DeBell received right around maybe a little above some $350,000 as it relates to a life insurance policy that he had on his wife, Tammy. Not saying anything negative about 
anyone having to file for bankruptcy. That happens in life. But I think it clearly is some indication here that uh, Lori Vallow likes kind of the good life. She likes fancy things. And in fact, she seems to find people who can support her uh, fancy lifestyle um, the way she likes to be uh, accustomed to. And as we have said, and maybe we can put a link to it, to the 12 undeniable truths from a criminal defense lawyer, it's always about the money. We'll see if that plays out. If you always follow the money, it usually leads you to the truth. Next on the docket, another cold case was solved. And today, the case comes from Sacramento, California. The Sacramento County Sheriff's Department announced the arrest of 71-year-old Philip Wilson in connection with the 1980 death of 20-year-old Robin Brooks. Brooks was found in her apartment after she had been sexually assaulted and stabbed inside her bedroom of her small apartment. Brooks had worked at a donut shop right near her apartment. Sergeant Michaela Lynx, who had worked on the case, had assumed that people had seen something in the apartment complex. The interesting thing about this case is that there's no evidence that Brooks actually knew Mr. Wilson. The police have no evidence the two of them were ever seen together or knew each other in any way. Ms. Brooks was 20 years old at the time, and Wilson was 31 at the time. And what's even more interesting is the fact that Philip Wilson was never even a suspect or came up in any way in the investigation. Through genetic genealogy, they were able to solve this 40-year-old cold case. The family of Ms. Brooks is obviously pleased, and they were always concerned that whomever committed this crime may not still be alive. At least now, there can still be justice for this family. Another interesting twist on this particular case is Sergeant Michaela Lynx is a retired police officer from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and she worked as a volunteer cold case detective working roughly 60 hours a month on this particular case. Sergeant Lynx stated that this case became very personal. When she would look at the photos of Ms. Brooks, she realized how much life she had ahead of her and that she never was able to fulfill that. Philip Wilson will be appearing in court shortly, and we will follow that case. Rather interesting. We talked about it the other day. That genetic genealogy is so uh, useful, and it's going to make uh, crime solving, particularly these old cold cases, um, even more likely. As we talked about uh, just last week, there was a case that was solved uh, from 1963 here in Colorado through genetic genealogy. Now they just need to find the suspect who would be in his 80s. Next on the docket is a cold case that needs our help. Somewhere, someone knows something about this cold case. And this cold case was known as the Valentine Day murder at Subway, and it took place here in Colorado. In the early morning hours of February 14th of 2000, Stephanie Hartz Grissel drove to the subway on Coal Mine Avenue to wait for her boyfriend, Nick Kunselman, who was finishing his shift at the Subway Sandwich Shop. These two teenagers were students at Columbine High School, where less than a year Earlier, 12 of their classmates and a teacher had been killed in a mass shooting. Now, over two decades later, their murders still remain unsolved, and authorities are now offering a reward of up to $12,000. Although that is not a lot of money, maybe it will be enough for someone to come forward. There have been few credible leads in this particular case, and in fact, there's even been people that have confessed to this particular case, but they have all turned out to be false. The only thing that they can possibly come up with is a description of a possible suspect as a white male, 16 to 20 years old, 
about five foot seven and between 150 and 170 pounds with blonde hair. Stephanie and Nick were obviously very young as they were still in high school. What makes this murder even more shocking is the fact that there's really no motive whatsoever. There's no evidence that a burglary took place or that any money was missing from the cash register. Now, the police want to stress that no matter how insignificant the tip may be, it could be something that could ultimately break the case. We've talked about this before when we've discussed cold cases. There's always someone somewhere that knows something. They have that gut instinct that tells them that something is not right or that some criminal activity has been afoot. It may have been a long time. Maybe somebody said something when they were drunk at a party. Those types of tips are what solve cases. And then police can go back and perhaps get some sort of uh, DNA. It hasn't been released. What if anything's been found? But it would seem as though there's been little or nothing there. So it's going to come back to somebody uh, coming forward and saying that somebody was drunk at a party and they told me they did this. Stephanie and Nick deserve this case to be solved. Their families deserve this to be solved. Their high school classmates deserve that this be solved. Stephanie and Nick were laid to rest side by side at the Mount Lindo Cemetery above Highway 285 here in Colorado. It's visible from far and wide for its large lit up cross that appears on the mountainside. Maybe somewhere someone will see this and say, I remember talking to someone who mentioned this case or those facts or just something weird or creepy. It could be the difference. If you have that information, contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. This is a lesson in don't be lazy or drunk. Because if you're drunk and lazy, that's even a worse combination. Well, our dumb criminal contestant of the day is Michael James Gables. He's 65. And he apparently called 911 to report an emergency. When the deputies responded to his residence, Mr. Gables told the officers to take $20 from the couch that was there and go to the liquor store and buy him some liquor. Needless to say, the police informed him that this was not an emergency. Basically, don't waste our time with it um, and have a good day. Now, throwing complete caution to the wind, the next day, Mr. Gables called and made another emergency 911 call and the operators dispatched deputies to his apartment once again. This time, Mr. Gables asked the deputies to take his ice cream out of the freezer since he wasn't able to get out of his recliner. Apparently, since Mr. Gables wasn't in distress or in need of medical attention, deputies placed him under arrest for misuse of 911. Police officers are are busy, except maybe in Laredo, Texas but they don't have time anywhere to make liquor runs or to get your ice cream out of your freezer. So therefore, Mr. Gables, you are a dumb criminal contestant of the week. And you know what? We may just try to find you and send you a mug. Why, you might ask? Because, well, frankly, I think you're too lazy to claim it yourself if you win. Finally on the docket... You never know what's going to happen in life. Um, Some days your life kind of feels like Forrest Gump. You think, man, who would have thought? Little old me growing up and, you know, nothing nothing fancy, working class family. Um, First one really to go off to, to college, let alone receive a graduate degree and go to law school. And then one day a kid starts up a little YouTube channel. And then the next thing you know, you get a call from Vanity Fair and their YouTube channel. And they want you to talk about court proceedings uh, in movies and see if they're, in fact, realistic. Now, we can't put it up on our channel, but we can certainly give you a link to the Vanity Fair channel and see how we did. Hopefully, we did all right. Hopefully, we didn't embarrass ourselves or any of the Crime Talk family out there at all. Let us know what you think. Hopefully enjoy it. 
Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow on Crime Talk.